everybody. Ah, I'm today in my Italy rain jacket. So no jersey, but other gear. And of course Italy. I want to talk about the Nations League today, which starts on Thursday. And before getting into the games, although I can give you right away, it starts off with a cracker. Germany against uh, France, the Leicester World Champions meeting in Munich. What a way to start the Nations League. Honestly, this is uh, about as good a start as it can get. Uh, there's also another very interesting game, I think Ireland versus Wales. Uh, which maybe is not the glamour match, but whenever two British teams meet and they met already in World Cup qual qualification, uh, it's guaranteed to be, at least from the atmosphere, a great game. Uh, there was some bad, there's I think still some bad blood because of uh, the last game ended with a bad injury, so uh, we'll be curious to see, but I, if I'm gonna watch it, I'm, I'm probably gonna, because uh, Germany, France, it's about as good as it gets. Um, so, that will be the game I'm going to look forward to. Then, on the second match day, uh, second day, that's Friday, we have Italy versus Poland. That's the, I don't want to say clever matchup because uh, that group is not as great as Group 1 in League A. I think it is already. Uh, I think Spain has the double DP. I think it's England versus Spain on the next day, and Switzerland, Iceland. Those are the League A games that I kind of looked, which are definitely clever matchups. Uh, and those are the ones that most people will watch. I'm absolutely certain about that. Um, but yeah, I think also the other. Uh, leagues, if there, I mean, there is Slovakia and the Czech Republic are in one group. I mean, that's an interesting match. We have also Turkey playing Russia. I think that's also intriguing uh, to a certain extent. Um, Czech Republic, Ukraine. I don't also don't think it's that bad. And of course, then you have. Uh, I'm very curious, not about the game, but the situation for Denmark. Uh, if you haven't read it, the. Players Union of Denmark hasn't agreed, uh, hasn't reached an agreement with uh, the Football Federation about extending their contract and it's, I think the problem is uh, sponsors that the players want that they can uh, have other sponsors than the ones for the Football Union or endorse other sponsors, something to that I have not fully, fully understood um, the uh, whole background story, but yeah, it's an ugly one. And then Danish football, I don't know. Uh, to me, it sounds foreign, to be honest, uh, that the players need to reach an agreement with the National Soccer Federation. Um, but maybe that's a part of soccer business that I have not dealt much with. Uh, but it seems foreign to me a little bit, to be honest. Uh, I thought that players there. Yeah, maybe you have to submit to a certain code, but that goes that far that you have to reach a bargaining agreement. Interesting, interesting. Well, the point is that the players actually offered, in order to be able to play games, offered uh, an extension of the existing agreement for these next two games so that they can actually feel the squad. But no, uh, Football Federation said no. And yeah, they already had to cancel a women's match because of similar negotiations last time around. And maybe that's where the problem lies, because the women said we want to get the same uh, amount of money as the men. Uh, and I think they are, they are at least, I could understand the what's behind them. Maybe now they try, if the men have a new counter, maybe they get more money. I have no idea. I really don't. Um, I also would think that if you are part of the national team during that time, I think you should not endorse other products, at least publicly. I mean, if they run commercials with you, yeah, I, it's a tricky situation. I mean, we had, you know, to something similar once with a famous gear. Um, she 
had a manager who almost on purpose went against the Austrian Ski Federation um, to uh, sign her up with sponsors. I think it was uh, BMW against uh, Audi. Uh, some, something like that, which was kind of uh, weird from the beginning. But yeah, the Danish, well, the, what I read, and, uh, and then we talk really about na the Nations League, uh, the Danish potentially won't be able to field a squad or they will try to field a squad with uh, underclass players, which I find highly entertaining in a way. Uh, they play at least league in this League B, so second level of the Nations League. And uh, if you forfeit the game, I think it, they only have one competitive game, but I might be wrong here. Uh, as we will see, there are three slots one in September, one in October, one in November, and at every slot one team gets two games. And yeah, I hope it's not for Denmark, but uh, I honestly don't know their group now by heart. Uh, I have an inkling that they might have to play against Sweden, uh, but yeah, whatever. Uh, it's a bad situation and it could reach uh, the point where UEFA has to ban um, Denmark from competing, which I really hope is not ha happening. I think there should be a way to resolve it without having Denmark banned for 2020. Nations League. That's what I want to talk about. I'm cut off on the Denmark tangent, but I think it's a very recent development that definitely deserves some time. So uh, I have said it before, and I say it again as a soccer nut, I am getting excited about the Nations League. Um, now, this doesn't mean much because I also get excited about the Confederations Cup, where everyone else doesn't get um, excited about, but I actually like the tournament. Uh, I hope it continues. It gives me in pre-World Cup years a chance to watch some uh, national team soccer that's somewhat decent because most teams do take it seriously once you're there. The Nations League, I think all teams will take it serious as well, although we already saw that Ronaldo will not play for Portugal and they will have to play Italy at home uh, on match day two. But um, what I think he, uh, they will get, I mean, first of all, it's competitive. Second, uh, what it did is it guarantees many players already, uh, many uh, federations, a fixed slate of, friend, uh, of yeah, replacement friendlies. They won't be friendlies any, 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 anymore. But uh, especially the smaller teams who these days really have a hard time finding opponents. Therefore, matching them against equal level opponents is a really smart idea. I think this only can strengthen them. Uh, you know, San Marino now and Andorra have now a good slate of games ahead of them against opposition that they might actually match up well against. So uh, that I think is a good thing to have. Uh, it's also done smartly that you have these four leagues. Uh, and it reminds me a little bit about the uh, hockey. I'm talking ice hockey. When I say hockey, I'm taking the American Canadian terminology. Hockey for me is ice hockey. Uh, field hockey, yeah, while interesting to watch at the Olympics here and there, uh, to me is a uh, still a little bit of a weird sport. Uh, ice hockey is my second, third favorite sport, uh, right up there. Uh, love it, absolutely love it. That's a, that's a great game, absolutely a great game. But I'm getting off, Nations League. Uh, so the, the tier system with League A, B, C and D is really like uh, the International Ice Hockey Federation has it, uh, where they also have an A World Championship, a B World Championship, and so on. Um, and I think it's smart because you keep the, you keep teams that are a similar uh, level, you keep them kind of together, and you always have uh, good competition. What I hope will not happen is what happens sometimes in ice hockey that if a team uh, gets to the next level that they're completely out of sorts but I actually think that in Europe things are so tight together uh, that this is not going to happen and also what's guaranteed is by the setup of the entire tournament 
that it actually uh, there will be a lot of mixing between the leaks. Um, you have every time four teams going down, four teams going up. So especially leaks B and C will look very different every time going around. And actually it will be quite interesting because I think some big names could drop to League B. And that's always a nice thing to have. Uh, I was wondering if it's a little bit too much. So we have the four leagues. In each league we have four groups. Uh, in leagues A and B the groups of uh, three teams each. And in league C there is one uh, group of three and then there are three groups of four. And league D uh, it's all groups of four. So uh, they have a full slate of fixtures in League D, uh, League C similarly, except one that has a little bit more leeway, can schedule some friendlies. Uh, I actually think it will not it will not be a bad thing if uh, the UEFA gets another member, uh, so they can even up the leagues. But yeah, which nation is gonna split up next? Ay <laughs> ay 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 ay! If it's I have a candidate in Spain, but no, let's not go there. Now in each league the top teams advance, except in League A where the top teams go into the Final Four to get the Nations League winner. And, Le and, in, and the top four teams, but the, uh, not the bottom four teams, I'm getting mixed up. The traffic here is horrible at the moment, I'm trying to get in the other lane and it's just wall to wall traffic. Uh, now I made it. Um, so in the bottom four teams do get relegated to uh, the lower level. Uh, there is one ex um, one caveat here is in League C since we have the groups of four. It's definitely that the lower team gets relegated. But since there's one group of three teams. They take all the third place teams and only count the games among the top three and then the lowest one will go down. So it could be that from one group there are two teams relegated. Not totally happy about the system but I see it makes sense. So that's how it's and it's uh, they're played on a home and away basis. And of course if you're in League D you cannot get relegated, you are already at the bottom, but I that's not the point here. It's really the point that smaller level teams get games against similar opponents. The only thing I'm afraid of is the travel cost. But I think UEFA already covered that in a way because the teams get a lot of money. Uh, you get uh, money for participating, I think it's 1.5 million for the top team, the League A teams. Million for uh, for League B teams and then uh, 7.5 million something like that for leagues uh, C and D. Then the first place team gets the same amount uh, for winning the group. And then it goes already the, in the final four. Uh, there's a lot more money to be made. I mean, it gets 4.5 million. Uh, second, 3.5, 2.5, 1.5 for fourth place team. So. Um, there is some money involved, which for the federations I think is good. I'm not sure um, for the players it's almost peanuts, but I think the federations desperately need money. So that's how the structure works. Now uh, there are some more interesting things that come with all of that. First of all, um, at the conclusion of the Nations League, the teams are ranked and this ranking determines the seeding for the actual qualification for Euro 2020. How are they ranked? Well, you take all the first place teams in League A, rank them according to the points total. Then second place teams, third place teams, fourth place teams, then you go to League B. And you always look within the ranks uh, how teams are placed and that gives an order and from that order they derive the pots. Uh, so far so easy. It gets a little bit more complicated with the next uh, feature which every league gets a qualification spot for Euro 2020 um, which to me is a little bit nonsensical for League A because you would expect that every team qualifies but then yeah there is the Netherlands and Italy in there and, uh, they probably won't necessarily qualify and I'm not saying it's not those two teams it can be any two teams so what's happening is there will be that uh, 
in theory, the uh, group winners play in a playoff for another qualifying spot. Um, now, if the group winners would have already been qualified via the um, regular Euro qualification, then the next place teams uh, go in. So, in theory, even a third place team could reach a uh, playoff. Now, this will be especially interesting, I think, for Leagues A and B, where I, th I would expect a lot of teams qualifying, probably even for Leagues C. It could happen. I mean, Serbia uh, is in League C. Uh, I think it's the biggest name team uh, in there. So, um, I think there will be some shuffling around and it might get a little bit confusing, I fear. I th but I actually think for League D, I don't see anyone qualifying from there. But, you know, Paul, Albania qualified for the Euros. And were, but probably there were a third pot, no, there were pot four team. So, um, you never know, you never know. So they have covered the bases, but uh, those qualified players will be then played at the conclusion of the Euro qualifiers. Again, what I don't, what I'm curious to see is, let's say in League A, all but one team has qualified for Euro 2020. Uh, will then, there's only one team left, will this team also be automatically qualified or does it go down to include League, league uh, teams of League B or will get teams of League B promoted to League A status? That's for me the interesting part. Also, um, same scenario. I mean, this did this was 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 extreme scenario. Uh, but if do you fill spots from below? Let's say that yeah, that's exactly what I say now. So let's say we have only one or two teams from League A that didn't qualify. So the League A qualifying playoffs, there would be two semifinals and one final for the last spot. Um, do you fill this up with teams from uh, League B? That I'm, that's I think is going to, going to be interesting to see. Probably with the Nations League ranking, they might do something like that. Um, doesn't make much sense to me in that case, but yeah. I guess you want to give everyone a chance. Um, I think it's great that a League D team can make it to the Euros via the Nations League. Um, I am just afraid. I, the initial gut feeling was I'm afraid that they might get clobbered in in the Euros. But then again, we had some small teams qualifying for the uh, Euros. Albania, I remember Latvia at one point. So I don't think they will be that out of sorts. I, th uh, I think the worst team at the Euros that I've seen was Turkey in 96. They were really completely out of it. Uh, in a way, and even then they didn't fall off that much. But they were probably the worst team that I've seen at the European Championship. Uh, not from a performance, because they put the heart and soul in there, but uh, from the results where you could actually see as the game progressed um, that they are just a level below the rest. But that was also a 16 team tournament and that was the time when Turkey was on the rise. I mean the next time they were participating they were already in the quarterfinals. So it shows there's a lot of level play in Europe, in Europe. and that's I think what the Nations League, uh, what will make the Nations League great. So yeah, as I said I'm looking forward to France against Germany, that's uh, Germany against France, and then uh, France plays the uh, Netherlands. Yeah, we have the League A groups, I can quickly run through them because I know them, I hope by heart. <laughs> we have the big group is group, the first group, that's uh, Germany, France and the Netherlands. You couldn't wish for a nicer group. The only bad thing is that one team will be relegated and in this case I think it will be the Netherlands. But every team here has a rivalry with the other team. The only thing is that um, the France and the France and the Netherlands don't share a border. That would be the kicker. Uh, we have then, I think the second group is Belgium, Switzerland and Iceland. Um, 
not a glamour group, I would say, uh, but definitely interesting. Then uh, group C is Portugal, Italy and um, Poland in there. I think quite interesting group. Uh, don't sleep on Poland. They have, they have, they disappointed at the World Cup, but when it comes to European play, Poland can pull it together. I think it's a very uh, tricky group. I'm curious to see. I actually would, a uh, gut feeling tells me that without Ronaldo, uh, as kind of an aging squad, Portugal might have trouble in that one to stay in the Nations League. I'm not saying they're gonna get last. Uh, I also think this will be a group where Italy will try to rectify things that they belong up there. And it will be interesting to see. I am curious what Roberto Mancini is gonna pull out there, uh, whether the Italy squad will be again one to be reckoned with or whether they really deserve to not be there. Well, they, des they deserve to not be there because uh, they failed to qualify, though it was a hard road. Um, and yeah, then the last uh, group is is the other glamour group, if you uh, will. Uh, it's Spain, England, and Croatia. And the interesting part is that uh, Spain is the team that had the most disappointing World Cup in that group, uh, and they have the I think they have the double um, uh, day. So we have in group. Uh, group one, the double, uh, the team that plays double is of course um, France. As we said, we have uh, Germany, France, and France, Netherlands. I think that the Netherlands are the weakest team in this group. Uh, they almost didn't make it to Group A. I was, uh, if the Netherlands, I think, would have lost their last qualifying game, Austria would be in Group A, which I still cannot quite believe, but that it went that far. Uh, Second group, I think Belgium is Belgium and Switzerland. I think will will do it, but um, never sleep on Iceland. Uh, but I think Belgium will be the team that goes uh, that will win this group. Uh, I think Belgium is ahead of the, the other two, and then it's quite a kind of um, I hope Italy will win the. Group C, I, this one is to me the most open one, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, despite the disappointing Euros, I think Spain is favored to win Group D. I actually think that Spain is even, uh, at the moment, a bookie favorite to win the Nations League. Uh, still cannot quite understand it. I probably have to do, uh, you know, whenever you want to know who's favored or not, it's usually a good thing to look at bookies. Uh, although I'm a little bit baffled by having Spain as the top dog for the Nations League. And then in addition, um, when you look for the odds for winning the Champions League at the moment, it's Manchester City, which... Uh, it would be interesting, but I don't see it. I honestly do not see Manchester City as the top favorite for the Champions League. Well, yeah, that's... Uh, so we have um, the fourth group, Group 4 in League A. As I said, Spain, I think, will win that group. Uh, although, don't discount Croatia. I'm afraid England is the weakest team in there. But you have to see, I mean, Croatia, a lot of teams, a lot of players, not teams, retired from the national team. So maybe they are in a finding phase. Uh, but yeah, I said it ahead of the semifinals between England and Croatia. Uh, if they are well-rested squads, I would favor Croatia any day over uh, England at the moment. Uh, I'll be curious to see how it will play out. I think that could be a closer one, but I think Spain should win that group. Spain has the double day, um, same as I think Italy has the double day uh, for uh, Group 3. And I think it is... Iceland. I think Iceland has the double day for uh, the group two. Uh, I don't, don't nail me down on that one. Yep, Nations League.
I think it's a great concept. I really like. I really, really, really like that they came up with something like that. And the last thing, uh, you know, the groups of three, they can, they have now an open slot to schedule other friendlies, which, for instance, Austria used to schedule friendlies against Sweden and Denmark, which I think are really good opponents to play against. Um, just. You have the feeling they're a tad above, but uh, within beatable range. So this was a smart scheduling move. Um, but then you also, basically for League A teams, you allow them. Yes, here you have two dates where you can play Argentina and Brazil. Uh, yes, Francis. Uh, now the Netherlands are playing Peru. I saw. I don't know who France is playing uh, as a friendly. If they play another friendly. Yep. I think it's an interesting concept. It's an interesting concept. It reduces the burden, especially for smaller teams, of finding uh, friendlies. You always have competition. I think it is also in response to the uh, extended qualifying campaign for South America, where the South American teams get a lot of competition uh, with uh, 18 games each. And actually, that's a reason why South America teams are also very level at this moment. Uh, I think this this qualification campaign has always one of, one of the big boys, mostly Argentina, but uh, that was also when our Brazil was struggling. Um, there, you have to play until the last game day, and I think the Nations League is trying to do that uh, for Europe, and for that, I like it a lot. I really hope that Argen uh, that FIFA will not come up with uh, World Nations League because that will get clumsy and clunky, I think. Well, I made it to work. Uh, let me know what you think about the Nations League. Are you going to watch matches? Are you looking forward to it? What do you think about it in general? Um, if you liked my rumblings about the Nations League, give me a thumbs up. And subscribe to the channel if you want to see more of these. And I will talk to you soon. Bye. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe to my channel. If you've already done so, I would like to thank you for your support. It is very much appreciated. Also, check out the accompanying blog at the link provided in the description below and at the end of this video. Thank you for watching and until next time.